Uh, so thank you guys all for joining. We're really excited uh, for our October chapter meeting. We have quite a few exciting uh, pieces, co uh, announcements coming up. And we obviously have a special guest here, uh, David, who will be um, covering our topic of soft landings. Um, so with that being said, um, let me skip over to introductions and welcome you everyone. So like I said, one welcome. Uh, so for those that you don't know me, my name is Jessica Alstam. I'm the president of Greater Cleveland Ch uh, Chapter of Wild Ones. Um, we're a national nonprofit organization that promotes the importance of native plants and restoring the ecosystem. And we are just the local chapter here. We have over a hundred different chapters spread throughout the nation. Um, but uh, we're really excited um, to have you all here today. Uh, so why don't we go down the list? Uh, who would like to introduce themselves next? Sierra, I'm going to call on you next since I see you in one of my windows. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sierra Rawson and I'm a communication chair, actually. So I get to work on the newsletter. Um, what if I just hand it to someone else and then they can pass it to someone else? Um, so I'm seeing Jennifer Yates. Jennifer, you might be on mute. I know sometimes she has some challenges. Oh, are you trying to talk, Jennifer? Oh, well, then I'm going to call on a second, or, or, or a Sierra, I'm going to take over and call on Julie, because I would love Julie to introduce her new assistant. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I have a kid that's like begging for attention. Um, hi, I'm uh, I'm the web chair for our uh, for our chapter, and I also um, own a native plant nursery uh, in Cleveland. Um, and I'm gonna call on Dave, who is also part of the nursery. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm my name is Dave Tomaszewski, and um, I work with uh, Julie as well as our friend Alyssa at Meadow City, and um, yeah, just focusing on. Um, you know, finding the right plants for customers and also um, educational programs. So presentations um, like the one I've been invited to give tonight. Oh, I don't know who to, I don't know who to call on. I haven't been to one of these meetings before. So I'm going to um, just kind of, ran <laughs> I'm going to randomly select someone. Um, have we, let's see here. How about uh, Ann Morrison? Um. Hi, <laughs> uh, I'm new. Uh, I joined, I think, last month, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm hoping to get lots of great ideas for my property, and um, that's about it. <laughs> um, let's see. Great. Welcome, Anne. Who would you like to call on next? Um, let's see. How about um, see a uh, Julie S. Or did we do? <laughs> oh, I already went. Oh, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, how about Sarah? Hello, everyone. Um, I live in Cleveland, and this is my first time participating in one of these webinars. Um, so I am just happy to listen and and learn something new. Um, I'm always trying to work and improve my garden. I have some natives, um, but honestly, I'm not 100% sure what they all might be. So um, yeah, just oh, just uh, wanted to hear some more. Great, right, well, we're excited Thanks. to have you, Sarah. And if you're a Thanks. member, um, be sure to also join our Facebook member group because uh, that's a great resource. You could like post pictures and ask questions. Oh. And Fantastic. And, and I, yeah, I think I am because that that's, I think that's how I heard about the meeting tonight. Okay. Um, and actually my mom is on the call too, I believe. So <laughs> I will call on her next. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
And who is your mom? Karen. Karen. Karen, would you like to introduce yourself? Karen, if you're talking, you're on mute. All right, it might be that Karen has stepped away or might be having technical difficulties. Um, let me see. Jane, would you like to go next? Um, sure. Um, I'm a relatively new member of Wild Ones. I have planted a native uh, garden thanks to Meadow City and their advice. Um, it's 100% native and looking forward to what's coming up in the spring. Great. Thank you, Jane. Who would you like yeah. to call on next? Oh, uh, how about Laura? Thanks, Jane. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Laura Fortner Monaghan, and usually my husband Jack is here. So that's why it says Laura and Jack. He's on a work trip. Um, we have been members for a few months now. I am the membership chair. So for those of you who are new, you probably got an email from me or maybe we've talked on the phone. Um, and so I'm always looking for anyone who would like to help support that. We really reach out to new members, make sure we, we have some touch points for them. Um, but glad to see such a good showing tonight. So, um, and I will stop there. Uh, hi, Laura. I am here. Jennifer Yates. <laughs> Joined the meeting. So Jack can introduce himself now. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jack. Um, just in a hotel right now on a work trip, but I thought I'd come in anyway. Um, I am the assistant web chair uh, is my position. Uh, and my garden is just Laura's garden, so <laughs> I came in late, so I don't know who uh, hasn't gone yet. All right, so let me see who we have. Uh, Diane, I see you on the line. Yes, hi, I am on the line. I'm Diane Plesia, and I live in Strongsville, and I've been... Uh, a member of Wild Ones for several months now. And I just have some native plants in my yard and always looking to expand my selection. Great. Welcome, Diane. Thank All you. right. Uh, next, I see Kim. I don't believe Kim has gone yet. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, oh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Gavel. I'm actually a little outside of the Cleveland area. I'm over in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I joined uh, only about a week or two ago. So I'm really excited to be here and learn more about the native plants. And um, thanks. Well, we are excited to have you, Kim. And uh, the great thing is you are so close to us. I, I know it might be a little bit of a drive for some of our events, but we do some, uh, you know, have some towards the border. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, obviously we try to do online. And the great thing is, is that uh, there is a ton of overlap of native plants for our area since it's all along the, the Great Lakes. So I'm excited right. to have you here. Well, thank you. All right. Uh, I see Emily is on the line. Emily, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hopefully my microphone is working okay. I have headphones, so it might sound bad. Sorry. <laughs> no, we um, hear you. Hi. Um, good. Perfect. I'm Emily. Um, this is my second meeting, so I'm still fairly new. Um, but yeah, excited to be here. Uh, right now, I know I've seen a few cone flowers around, which I was kind of surprised um, that are still looking pretty good. So exciting. I hear you on that one, Emily. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you again. 
Uh, I see Deborah is on the line. Deborah, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Deborah Osgood. Um, I've never been to any of these meetings, so I it actually came up on Facebook, and I um, took I'm taking advantage. Um, I'm a pretty avid gardener. Quite a few native plants in my garden, and um, um, just interested in learning more. Great. Well, we're happy to have you. All right, and then. I see Milkweed Matt is on the line. Matt, would you like to say hi? Okay, there we go. Am I on? Yes, you are. I see, <laughs> I was watching, I seen Jennifer Yates bailed out right before she was about to get called. <laughs> <laughs> I see she was next in line and she left. Um, but hi, I'm I'm Matt Milkweed, Matt Matt Balico. Um, I guess we're just doing introductions. I just signed in. I mean, um, I don't know. I've kind of grown a, a a passion for this over the last few years, and one thing led to another, and uh, got uh pointed in the direction of the wild ones and joined the wild ones. When was it? I don't know, maybe June or July or something. And, you know, I'm new to the group. Uh, I've taken part in a couple of gatherings and stuff like that, but um, definitely um, passionate about learning more and spreading the knowledge to other people and, um, you know, just restoring habitat. Uh, wherever possible and I don't know so far I'm, I'm I'm enjoying this and um enjoy being around you know like-minded people so um so far so good and uh I don't know nice to see all the new people that are logged in that I, I haven't met or anything like that it seems to be a pretty uh a little bit bigger group than some of the other online meetings I've sat in but all right, I'll be quiet now. Thank you, Matt. Um, all right, so I think I caught most of the group, but for anybody that had some technical difficulties and wanna say hi, I'll, I'll just give it a moment. Um, does anyone else wanna say hi? I can introduce myself. Oh, hi, Danielle. <laughs> hi, everybody. Most of you know me, uh, but we do have a pretty good crowd tonight. I'm Danielle. I live in Elyria. I've been with Wild Ones for a good while, about eight years, and I served six years on the board, first as membership chair and, um, and then as secretary. Um, really happy to see how this group um, of Greater Cleveland area has um, developed and is blooming and continues to grow, and I'm happy to see everybody here today. I, uh, I've been working with native plants for quite a while. I'm getting ready to launch a nonprofit. Uh, professionally, I work as a naturalist. I, uh, I cultivate plants, uh, native plants, and I, I'm heavy into education, just uh, involved with the community, and so kind of tying everything together. Um, just happy to be a part of this group and have you all here with us. Great. Well, thank you, Danielle. Anyone else that we either missed or was having technical difficulties? Well, I'll say hi. I'm Connie Ann, my son, Jeff, and I think my daughter-in-law, younger son, Dan and Sarah are also members. And I want to learn more. And it's just was so nice yesterday. I I stood out in the pollinator garden and watched all the different kind of bees around the Michael Mass. And I don't know if that's really one of our native plants, but anyway, it was nice. <laughs> and good to see a, such a nice group. Great. Well, that was exciting to hear. So thank you. Um, anyone else? All 
All right. Well, I'm really excited that we had such a great turnout. So I know it's a little bit easier now that we're out of the summer months. Um, so uh, just a few updates. Um, so we had four new members in the last month. Um, so I don't think any of them are on the line, but if you see them or, or talk to them, um, please say hi and welcome them to our group. And then for those of you that are not members, if this is something that really interests you, um, you know, please consider becoming a member. Um, you know, every little bit helps. We try to keep as much as possible, um, actually roughly uh, 90, 95% of our events and activities are free and open to the public. And by becoming a member, that allows us to support that effort um, to keep as much of this as free and, and available to the public as possible, both our in-person and online events and activities. So, uh, and going into the next year, that will also allow us to do even more events and activities, uh, such as like that we did two uh, native plant garden installations this year and a variety of other things. So uh, the more people we have to support and, and volunteer, the more that we can do with our, our community efforts. So please take a moment and consider joining us. Uh, with that being said, a couple of the things that we've done in the last couple of weeks, I'm not sure if anybody is on the line from this, um, but we were recently invited by the Highland Heights Green Task Force to join them and at an effort and do a seed bomb event. Um, so Janice, who unfortunately is not on the line, was kind enough to represent Wild Ones with regards to this, and we helped supply the seeds and and working with Janice, uh, you know, we, there was a little workshop, but it was really cool. And you can see all the little seed bombs that we created. Um, so this is another example of some of the event activities that we try to do with the public and hopefully more to come. Um, and uh, two other events, unfortunately I don't have pictures of the one. Uh, we had our Guy Denny Prairie Tour and Seed Collection. Um, as well as the Shaker Lakes Autumn Festival happening on the same day on October 7th. Uh, so a few of the pictures here you see are from the Shaker Lakes Autumn Festival. Uh, we were there to share information. Um, and at the Guy Denny Prairie Tour, people got to be, were educated upon on nature, uh, I apologize, misspeaking, uh, native plants and how to collect those seeds. And Danielle, I believe you were at the event, correct? Yeah, I was there. Did you want to share anything about it or? Um, yeah, I guess just real quick. So we got there and there was a pretty healthy crowd standing around a very, very quiet man. And so I could not quite hear what he was saying because I'm partly deaf, but I got to talk to Guy on the side. Um really uh honestly my favorite part was just meeting him but the prairie itself was phenomenal uh definitely the most uh developed and diverse prairie i've ever seen so if you have the opportunity to tour the prairie or to collect seeds i definitely encourage encourage you to do that thank you danielle so um you know like she said this is a, a really great prairie uh, usually there's only roughly two times a year that this type of activity is available to us. One time in the summer and one time in the fall. In the summertime, it is absolutely gorgeous, especially um, it's also great for photo opportunities. Um, and, uh, and then for the fall, on top of being great for photo op opportunities, it's a really great time to collect seeds um, uh, for native gardens and whatnot. So um look for us to do more of those activities all right so next um just wanted to remind the group for those that weren't a part of the last meeting um and didn't have a chance to maybe read some of the emails going out but we do have a new chapter members only facebook group so i know a few of you have already joined but if you are a member um this is more of a discussion page for our members to share photos or ask questions or, you know, you know, just it's a really great opportunity to talk and discuss or share your accomplishments or, you know, things along those lines. So, um, you know, just take a moment and uh, be, be sure to join. Um, 
And keep in mind that we still have the main page. So the main page is still for absolutely everyone to make sure we share events, activities, but also our educational material. So um, that other one's not going away, but we wanted to offer this opportunity um, for, for more open discussion on different topics and, and things that are going on for our members. So uh, be sure to go out and join today if you haven't already. Um, next with regards to updates. So uh, we're very close uh, to having our signage ready for Northeast Ohio Native Habitat Corridor. Um, so Julie has been working really hard with the team on this. And if everything goes well, <laughs> I'm not promising this timeline yet, we are hoping to have actual signs available for people to purchase um, in December. If that does happen, the earliest it would be is mid-December. Um, but there is a chance that this will, might not be ready um, and available until more like uh, January. So, but we're trying our hardest to, to have it here in time for, for the holidays um, and, and have signups and everything. So more to come. Uh, some other updates. So uh, we are excited and we're, the team is working really hard on the planning for 2024. So as a part of this, um, most likely within the next couple of days, maybe early next week, we're gonna be sending out the annual chapter survey. Um, and uh, Laura and team has been working really hard on this. And so we're really excited to hear your guys' input on what you wanna see um going into that next year that could be events and activities that could be educational topics um there's going to be a lot of opportunity to, to gather your input so we can better plan and strategize um for going into 2024 so uh and that same thing goes for volunteering too so we we want to hear from you on this piece um also we're really excited to share uh that we're going to have our first fundraiser and as a part of that activity, it's going to have to do with us having temporarily uh, some Wild Ones Greater Cleveland t-shirts. So um, we're, we're working with the organization Custom Inc. Um, to create t-shirts uh, that people can order um, in the month of November. Uh, this period of time will only be open for a couple of weeks because the hope is that we want to try to get this out to you uh, by mid-December at the latest. Um, so this will be an opportunity, a little bit of fundraising, but also for t-shirts. So it's a great um, opportunity that Customing has provided us where uh, they donate a, a, a portion of the proceeds uh, to Wild Ones. Um, so we can, like I said, continue to have more events and activities. And this will be our first opportunity to have Wild Ones Greater Cleveland t-shirts. So uh, look for more information on that. Um, also for those that you didn't see, and this is for members specifically, uh, that fall journal issue is out. So be sure to go check that out. A lot of great opportunities and information on there in there. Um, also, for our members, if you haven't seen, the 2023 Wild Ones Annual Photo Contest is wrapping up. The submissions were obviously were already done um, towards the end of summer. However, uh, this is your opportunity to vote on um, the People's Choice Award. So there's over 700 entries, um, lots of fantastic photos. So be sure to vote. Um, before October 31st. So uh, you can see some really cool photos there. Um, in addition, guys, I'm very excited to share uh, that we are now fully chartered. Uh, so mm -hmm. now that we've gone through the legal process of that and whatnot, you're gonna see us do a lot more things. Obviously we're still in the process of planning and strategizing that. Uh, but um, you'll start seeing us do fundraisers and um, we might be able to start sponsoring um, special events, activities, maybe even being able to start funding or helping fund uh, besides just volunteering our efforts, 
uh, community native gardens as well. So I'm very excited about this accomplishment. Um, and we are hoping to have a special party in December uh, with regards to this, but just in general, our overall efforts for the year. So very excited about this, this milestone here. And thank you guys all for helping on this because this is not just a leadership effort. This is all of our members that helped get us to this point, whether that's volunteering in certain positions to helping us have certain act events and activities, because all of those are pieces of requirements to fulfill this. So this is this is not just one or two people leading this effort. It really is, a, it's a community effort to, to reach this. So very excited. Um, so some of our upcoming chapter events. So on uh, this Saturday, um, in partnership with my kind um, Dinah County uh, Parks District, um, there is going to be a community tree planting event um, this Saturday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, I want to call this out uh, because this is one of the few events that we do require registration. And this is required by the Medina County Metro Parks. Um, and uh, they're gonna be planting 150 native trees. So very excited about this. Um, and uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Deborah, did you say something? Nope. Okay, um, I just, I, I just said congratulations on the chartering. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Um, so next, uh, we will also be doing an invasive species workshop at Impet uh, Park. I believe this is a park um, near Fairview Park, North Homestead, Rocky River, right in that area. Um, so uh, we'll be working um, with a group and this will be open to the public. So if you wanna learn a little bit about invasive species and the removal and actually help them, <laughs> Uh, clean up the park a little bit. Uh, we'll be there from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And another item that we'll be doing probably at the beginning of November, uh, we're just finalizing a date, is uh, we're going to be doing at least one more seed collection event um, for the chapter and for anyone that just wants to collect some seeds for themselves. Uh, next, is the nature photo scavenger hunt. So Julie, did you wanna to speak to this a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is gonna be a fun event, um, you, which you can do uh, together with us in person or individually. Um, so keep an eye on our Facebook page uh, where we'll be posting a photo scavenger hunt list. And there's gonna be some specific items, some items that are pretty open to interpretation. Um, and you can do it on your own and just go to your favorite uh, park or natural area and take pictures and then um, submit them to us online. Um, or if you like to do things like that together with other people, uh, you can come out on November 11th. Um, we have to decide um, a location. So that'll be on the Facebook page event. Um, but uh, then we can go and take the photos together and hang out. Um, you don't have to be an amazing photographer to participate. Uh, there's going to be um, actually a small prize for the person who, sorry, <laughs> who gathers the most uh, points um, with kind of hitting some of the items on the list. And we'll also have a prize um, for the best overall photo that people will be able to vote on. Um, so just keep an eye out on the Facebook page for that. And uh, the prize will be um, two gift certificates from Meadow City. So you can come and get plants in the spring. Thank you, Julie. So we're very excited. This is the first time we're doing something like this. So um, really, really excited about this opportunity. Um, also, uh, I wanna make note that our November chapter meeting is still the same day or normal day, which is the third Thursday of every month. And that's, that's oh, that should actually say Thursday, November 16th. Um, but the time will change from Normally our meetings start at seven. That day only 
it'll start at 6 p.m. and it'll be a shorter meeting to 6.45. And the reason being is Wild Ones National is going to have a special live free webinar, um, The Gardener's Guide to Prairie Plants uh, with Neil, I'm probably butchering last names here, <laughs> the bowl, and Hillary Cox. However, I want to note that the webinar host is Doug Tallamy, and he'll be leading the Q&A. So you'll have an opportunity, um, if you register, uh, to submit your questions. So if this is something that interests you, make sure you register as soon as possible. And if you have a question you want them to answer, submit that because you have to submit that with your registration. So the later you do that, the less chance your, your questions will be answered or have that chance to be a part of that. So, um, but this is a really exciting opportunity that we wanted to share and make special time for. And thus that is why um, we're, we're changing our time a little bit and shortening it. So that way you can participate in this other great educational event opportunity. So like I said, make sure you register. Um, another thing, um, two things that we'll be doing in December, one's a little bit of a sneak peek that's not fully finalized yet, but you might have a special opportunity to do a movie night, um, which would include some sort of nature documentary. So more to come on that. Uh, in addition, um, we do have one of our first winter sewing uh, workshops that will be at the Medina County Nature Center on Sunday, December 3rd uh, at 1 p.m. with a potential second session at 3 p.m. Um, so we're gonna be doing uh, several of these types of winter sewing workshops uh, throughout the month of December, but actually more heavily in January. Um, so just wanted to show you guys a little sneak peek of a few things that we're working on. Um, And you might also see us at a few additional events during this time frame as well. Um, so volunteer opportunities. So obviously we can't run the chapter without our gracious volunteers. Uh, so a few of the positions that we're looking to fulfill sooner than later uh, is our assistant membership chair. Uh, so this is somebody that would help Laura. So Laura, would you like to speak to this a little bit? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, so um, for membership chair right now, the main thing is that we're emailing new members. We're sending out emails for folks who've uh, met us at an event that we've done just so that they can learn about us, decide if they want to join a call like this or if they'd like to learn, um, like ask more questions about the group and what we do. Um, we even reach out to people who their membership may have expired just to make sure that they know it has, if there's anything, if um, if they want to hear, maybe they haven't been as engaged so we can see if they want to re, um, uh, register for membership. We have templates for all of that. Um, I would say you probably want to be a little computer savvy because we have it all in a Google Drive with the templates and the emails and stuff. Um, we would love to have a couple of us to do some membership engagement brainstorming to see what um, ideas we want to have, how we want to keep membership engagement going. Um, really, it's not a huge time commitment, about one to two hours a week, maybe every other week. Um, some weeks are a little slower than others, like now that the summer season of all the events and stuff, it's slowed down a little bit. Um, this is all virtual, remote. so. Um, something that we could check in through emails. Um, we could also check in on calls. And yeah, the tools, the computer, um, we'd provide access to everything so you wouldn't have to create anything. Um, so yeah, if anyone's interested, um, please reach out. You can reach out to the Wild Ones email and just say that you're interested in this, um, learning more about it. And I'm happy to talk to you um, and, and see what you'd like to support. Great, thank you, Laura. And like and, and like Laura said, you know, more than one assistant would be fantastic because we're only going to continue to grow as a chapter. And the more people helping, the easier it is for everyone, and less of a commitment, so we can have more fun. <laughs> um, next, uh, now that we are through the chartering process, 
Uh, and, you know, we're getting really through that first year of, of you know, being a, a full chapter uh, is we're looking for a program chair. And this is somebody that would help league and organize our monthly educational sessions. This does not mean necessarily that you are the ones always educating, but you are at least helping coordinate efforts to make sure we have speakers every month and potentially other educational events and activities. Um, so this is at least a few hours a month. Um, it's not necessarily a weekly commitment um, other than maybe check in to make sure you know, our speakers are still committed or the, you know, the event's ready to go, things along those lines. Um, so if this is something that interests you, uh, please let us know. Uh, next is our events coordinator. Um, like you've heard us say, we are starting to have a lot of events coming up. Uh, maybe not as much as we had during the summer, but our goal is because we are such a large chapter, while we say Greater Cleveland, we actually cover all of Northeast Ohio except for the Youngstown area. Our goal going forward is really to be, uh, be able to have certain key events and activities in several of our areas throughout Northeast Ohio. Um, so an example, certain key topics that we want to really make sure it covers most of the areas is winter sewing is a perfect example. You know, we have Cuyahoga County, we have Lorraine County, we have Medina, we have, you know, the Akron Canton areas, you know, and it's hard for some people to travel to those, for some of those further locations, depending on where you're located. And that's really ha sometimes hard to do online. Um, so we do have that option sometimes to do these activities online, but if you really want to be able to do something in person, we're going to try to do our best to have a few of these key topics in multiple locations. So that way, you know, it, it covers some of, like I said, those key locations. So having that events coordinator to help keep all, track of all that and make sure we're sharing the appropriate information and the coordinating um, will be very key uh, for us moving forward. Um, in addition, uh, we're also looking for a marketing and publicity chair. This will just help us create marketing materials and publicize activities to the public, um, including possibly share with um, newspapers or you know local community news organizations and or social media groups um, to make sure we're we're getting that information out about our events and activities and the efforts that we're trying to put forward. So um, in addition, um, educational articles and posts. So this is a great way to volunteer, but not be committed to a certain position. So, and you do not have to be incredibly knowledgeable, or this is like, you have to be a teacher or educator on something, but maybe you've researched or are really enjoying um, one of Doug's Tally's books and want to write on, um, like you read up a lot on oak trees and you want to like, you know, that would be great to share and just take one time in one month and just say, you know, get a photo or two and maybe write a paragraph or two with a link out to something, share it with us in our email box. And we're happy to share that on social media. And, and that's a great way to just contribute a little bit um, and, and help share some of either the knowledge or something fascinating that you, you found or heard about. Um, and we can then share it with the group. So um, these are just a few examples of the ways that you can contribute to the chapter. But if there's none of these interest you or you're not sure, you know, what would be a good fit for you, don't hesitate and reach out. You know, please send us an email at wildonesgreatercleveland at gmail.com. And we're happy, you know, whether it's Laura or myself or somebody else on our leadership team, we're happy to have that conversation with you and to see what would be the best fit for you, whether it's based off of your interests and passions or just the amount of time you're able to commit. Um, because like I said, we appreciate every little bit our members are willing to help us with because, you know, even saving us one hour helps us do other events and activities or some other piece um or you know hey people need vacations and 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 uh be able to step away as that needed 
um, you know, especially around the holidays and things like that. So the more of us, the merrier. So any questions with regards to some of those volunteer opportunities? All right, so before we get into our educational topic for this month, um, just a few items that I want to call to your attention in addition to what we've talked about. So this weekend, we're doing a little bit of a social media challenge. Uh, it's been a little while, so I think it's been probably close to six months since we've done something like this. I just want to take a moment because we have had so many new followers and, and new members join. You know, please take a moment uh, this weekend and think about like friends or family members that this is something that might interest them or at least have a passion about um, learning or helping support and invite them to like our Facebook page or Instagram page. Um, we're also on LinkedIn and YouTube, but really it's Facebook and Instagram that has a lot of our great information on events and activities or educational articles or other pieces along those lines. Um, so that's where the meat of a lot of that information is. So please just take a moment uh, and or uh, if there's somebody that are really interested in us, um, you know, please take a moment and encourage them to become a member and, and actually join us at Wild Ones. So uh, there is a QR code there. Um, but if you need some more information on that, please do not hesitate to send us an email at wildonesgreatercleveland um, at gmail.com. Um, Cause like I said, Every person helps, uh, whether it's through all of that volunteering or even by just by being, being that member and helping support the financial efforts to, that goes towards those events and activities. Uh, in addition, uh, we want you to keep an eye out for that annual survey that we're expecting to go out probably in the next few days, as well as the Wild Ones Greater Cleveland um, t-shirt fundraiser, which you probably won't see that until uh, the beginning of November. So. Um, I'll just open this up to my leadership team, Julie and Sierra and, and Laura and Jack and, um, Danielle and a few others. Is there anything I missed? Okay. All right. So I will pass this off to Dave. So give me one moment just to stop sharing and then pass controls over to David. And then for those that might've joined a few minutes late, David is our guest speaker from Meadow City Nursery. So th thank you, David, for joining us. Yeah, hi, thanks very much for um, inviting me to, to present at your meeting. This is really cool. Okay. so. Um, all right, first I gotta share my screen, so just hang on a second. Let's see here. Okay, so you probably see my screen now. Let me um let me re reorient things here. Put it in slideshow mode. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, here, let me just move this. Uh, sometimes these toolbars are kind of pesky. Okay, fabulous. So, um, welcome to tonight's presentation on making the most of your tree with a soft landings garden. And um, a soft landings garden is simply uh, a shade garden consisting of native plants at the base of a tree. Um, but we will um, get more into that later. Um, I'm gonna start off with giving some background information. And I know um, many of uh, the Wild Ones members are familiar with a lot of this info, but um, I think it's great for uh, new folks to hear. And maybe there'll be some um, details that you are that are new to you. Oops, hold on now. Okay, great. 
So uh, I'm going to start off just by defining native plants. And native plants are simply the plants that are present in an area purely as a result of natural phenomena. Uh, so this means these plants weren't, uh, you know, planted by people. And um, uh, for this reason, it in most cases, it means these plants have been here for a really long time. So uh, thousands of years, at least. Um, uh, long ago, these plants colonized the landscape, seeking out areas that had the soil properties that were best for their growth. And true, two of the um, soil properties that you know, make the biggest difference are water retention and pH. So because of this, there is a really cool correspondence between maps of different kinds of soil and maps of native plant communities. And this is very true for Ohio. So for instance, uh, this map on the left is a map of Ohio's glacial deposits. This is simply the soil that was left behind uh, when the glaciers retreated uh, at the end of the last ice age. And the map on the right is a map of Ohio's native plant communities. And you can see uh, just how closely the two correspond to one another. And um, I really I really love this, uh, how it just shows the close link between our native plant communities and the soil itself. So uh, since our native plant communities have been here for so long, it's actually given the local wildlife time to evolve the ability to use these plants as a food source. So the native plant community, it's actually becomes the center of an entire ecosystem. In Northeast Ohio, for instance, uh, we have the beech maple forest ecosystem. So beech and maple are two of the dominant forest trees in the plant community, but that's the foundation of this whole ecosystem of uh, interconnected organisms that all rely on one another and uh, fundamentally on the plants themselves. And historically, some of the organisms that would be associated with the beech maple forest ecosystem include uh, black bears, the wood thrush, the rosy maple moth, and that's just to name a few. So how is all of our North American wildlife doing, which depends on these native plants? Unfortunately, the trends are not very good right now for a lot of North American wildlife. Um, since 1970, there's been a 29% loss in North American birds. So Matt, that means birds in North America are 29% uh, less common now than they were in the year 1970. It's cumulatively a loss of 3 billion birds over that time. Bringing it closer uh, to Ohio, uh, you know, our home state, there's been a 33% decline in butterflies just in the last 20 years. Uh, so uh, we're lucky that, you know, Ohio has actually been collecting that data. It's one of the uh, most intensive insect surveys that's been done anywhere in North America, but it's revealed that troubling trend. Uh, and finally, uh, bumblebees are 26% uh, of them are threatened with extinction, including um, species like the rusty patched bumblebee, which uh, has declined by 90% in recent years. And there are a lot of factors that are uh, contributing to these downward trends, but um, an international assessment determined that habitat loss is the leading threat to wildlife worldwide. So the good news is that we have a huge opportunity to restore habitat simply by landscaping with native plants in our yards. And as we'll see, um, that uh, kind of, you know, improvement that we can make and the habitat potential that we can uh, fulfill is oftentimes highest at the base of our trees. So I'm going to talk a bit now about why are trees so important to our um, uh, home landscaping. So trees are oftentimes the focal point of our home landscaping. They have a uh, dramatic size, uh, interesting structure, and striking seasonal beauty, as you can see by this red maple in its full fall coloration. Uh, incidentally, the springtime coloration is oftentimes really extraordinary for many of our trees. When those leaves are first uh, emerging, they're, they're striking colors. 
Now, uh, because of the size of the trees, um, the wildlife benefits of the tree are oftentimes tremendous. Uh, think about you know the size of a tree compared to the size of a flower. Uh, the wildlife benefits of the tree are similarly going to be um, magnified. And so some of those wildlife benefits include uh, pollinator benefits. Many of our trees are uh, insect pollinated, so they're providing um, a huge amount of floral resources to many of our pollinators. Um, here we have the black cherry, which blooms from mid-April to mid-June, uh, giving um, just a, a wonderful uh, supply of floral resources to our pollinators early in the season. Um, on the right is a picture of a large carpenter bee uh, visiting those black cherry flowers. But there's a huge range of pollinators that visit black cherries, willows, uh, red maples, and other native trees. Fruits and nuts are, all, are additionally uh, an outstanding uh, source of uh, wildlife benefits that our trees provide. Um, here we have a juvenile cedar waxwing, which is uh, just feasting on the berries provided by the black cherry. And um, acorns, black walnuts, and other nuts are similarly uh, just a real boon to our wildlife. Uh, recently, I was collecting acorns at the base of some uh, swamp white oaks, and I was really impressed with, uh, you know, how valuable the acorns must be, because even though they had fallen just a couple weeks prior, there were very few intact acorns left. They're really uh, collected and gobbled up very quickly by our, uh, by our wildlife. And finally, one of the most important benefits that our trees, particularly our native trees, are providing is they are the host plant for a huge number of caterpillars. So uh, trees like oaks, cherries, willows, these are all supporting tremendous number of caterpillars that are feeding on the foliage of those trees. Um, here, going on with our theme of black cherry, we have the eastern tent caterpillar, which is, uh, I, I think you're probably familiar with it. This is during the springtime, you can see its uh, web-like nests um, at the juncture of the cherry branches. And these caterpillars are uh, a wonderful source of food to our birds. For instance, the eastern tent caterpillar uh, is a favorite <clears throat> of our cuckoos and also the Baltimore Oriole, which is one of my favorite birds. Um, even though this caterpillar is a spiny one, the Baltimore Oriole has a, uh, uh, a clever way of dealing with that. And um, it pierces the outside of the caterpillar and maybe, you know, a little TMI, but, um, you know, it just goes to show the, the creativity of the bird in getting its meal. And, um, you know, it kind of just eats it up like spaghetti. So as important as those caterpillars are for the adult birds, they're even more important for the nestlings. 96% of our uh, terrestrial bird species rely on caterpillars as the major food source for their nestlings. Here we have a wood thrush that is uh, feeding its, its baby, um, a, a big green caterpillar that's just full of protein. Now, not all of those caterpillars, thank goodness, are going to fall prey to the birds. Uh, the, ones that, the ones that survive are going to um, uh, continue to feed on the foliage of the tree until they um, are finished with the caterpillar stage of their life cycle. And at that point, they need to undergo their uh, metamorphosis into the adult form. They need to undergo the cocoon stage. However, for 90% of our caterpillars, the cocoon stage does not happen in the tree itself, but rather on the ground at the base of the tree. So the caterpillar descends to the ground and there in the leaf litter or a couple inches below ground, it forms its cocoon and undergoes its metamorphosis to the adult form. So uh, here in the center of this image, what looks like the end of a cigar 
is uh, in fact uh, a cocoon and the caterpillar uh, has formed the outer layer of the cocoon with uh, some of the leaf litter. And this is a common practice uh, for many of our caterpillars, and it just illustrates how important uh, leaf litter is in the uh, cocoon process. So it doesn't really look like there's much going on here, but a little bit later and the adult emerges. In this case, it is one of our most beautiful species, the Luna Moth, with a four and a half inch wingspan and a uh, long trailing streamer-like tails on its wings. So unfortunately, the way that we commonly landscape in the near vicinity of our trees doesn't allow any of our uh, caterpillars to actually reach maturity. So here's a picture of a magnificent Schumard oak, a tree which on its own can support the development of over 400 uh, species of caterpillars. However, when those caterpillars are uh, done feeding on the plant's foliage and they descend to the ground, virtually none of them, because of the way uh, this landscaping has been carried out, will be able to uh, undergo the uh, cocoon stage. So because the grass here grows right up to the base of the tree and is being mowed, first of all, the ground is going to be significantly compacted. That means that the many caterpillars that burrow a short ways into the ground in order to uh, form their cocoons are probably not going to be able to do the digging that they need to do. Secondly, there's no leaf litter. So those caterpillars that form their cocoons using the leaves or uh, you know, being partially concealed by the leaves uh, as shelter, uh, they do not have that substrate which is necessary for them. Uh, thirdly, because the lawnmower is making frequent passes, anything that falls to the ground is going to be chopped up. So instead of landscaping in this manner, what we need to try to do is to create a soft landings garden. And the soft landings garden is simply a native plants garden uh, at the base of the tree consisting of uh, plants that are adapted to the shade and allowing for the caterpillar cocoon stage to take place. Now, not only uh, does, the, uh, does the soft landings garden allow for the uh, cocoon stage to occur, but it also presents an opportunity uh, for us uh, to provide a large number of floral resources to a lot of our pollinators by selecting shade-adapted native plants. Now, that is not always, uh, you know, an easy objective. The shade limits uh, a lot of what we can grow at the base of our trees. However, there are certainly some wonderful native plant options that will be blooming throughout the season, and I'll share a few of those with you now. So starting out in the month of May, we have Tiarella cordifolia. Uh, this is a plant that gets approximately one foot tall, so it's definitely not over dominant, but it does like to spread uh, and form a colony through the growth of um, above ground horizontal stems. And uh, over time, it will form this really nice patch with um, heart-shaped leaves and uh, uh, very, very pleasing uh, white fl uh, flower clusters early in the season. Another plant that you can plant in, in company with it that will uh, similarly bloom early in the year is Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder grows one to two feet tall and it has these soft blue blossoms. Um, this is really a tremendous uh, pollinator resource for both, for both long and short tongue pollinators. Um, it'll attract bumblebees, metallic green sweat bees, hoverflies, um, even butterflies are attracted to Jacob's Ladder. Another really nice thing about Jacob's Ladder is it has very attractive foliage which will persist 
throughout the growing season, even after the flowers fade. Now, as you move on into the summer months, it can be a little bit tougher to find uh, flowers that are blooming in the shade. Um, so unlike sunny spaces where there are a lot of options, uh, there aren't as many uh, shade blooming flowers during the middle of summer. For this reason, uh, it would, we would recommend that you plant um, an ornamental grass such as bottle brush grass. Bottle brush grass develops these very interesting seed heads that are going to um, add interest to your shade garden, garden during the middle of the summertime. Now there are indeed some uh, flower options for the middle of the summer, but these are primarily plants that do well in partial shade as opposed to full shade. Uh, many times uh, at the base of your tree, you're really more in a dappled sunlight, broken shade uh, situation as opposed to full shade. And many of these, uh, you know, so these partial shade flowers are certainly fine choices. Uh, on the left, we have monkey flower. Monkey flower does very well in part shade. You could plant it on the outer edge of your shade garden or in more of those dappled sunlight situations. What's really cool about monkey flower is it has special value to bumblebees. Those, um, those flowers, they have what's called the bilab bilabiate form and they're difficult to open up for a lot of bees. But bumblebees have the size and strength necessary to open those flowers up and access the floral rewards. And that means when they do, there's more for them there. So bumblebees are like VIPs when it comes to visiting monkey flower. And, um, you know, it's a great plant to have on hand when you're trying to, uh, you know, serve the bumblebees. This plant does especially well in wet areas. So if you have, you know, the double constraints of shade and, um, uh, you know, uh, an, an unusually wet situation, monkey flower is a really good choice. Now, if it's a drier partial shade area, um, one really excellent plant to consider for midsummer blooms is early goldenrod. So we're all used to um, seeing goldenrod you know, along the sides of the road and in various places uh, at the end of the summer and in the fall. But in fact, there is a July blooming goldenrod. And this is it, early goldenrod. It does very well in partial shade and it also has extremely good drought tolerance. Oftentimes, um, the area beneath trees does tend to be extra dry because those trees are taking up a lot of the water, which makes a drought tolerant plant like early goldenrod very useful. Um, and as we all know, the goldenrods are keystone plants because they support so much biodiversity. You really get the full range of pollinators when you plant a plant like early goldenrod. Okay, moving on uh, into late summer and into the fall, we have a few really nice shade uh, options for your shade garden. Um, these include the zigzag goldenrod on the left. So zigzag goldenrod has kind of an unconventional look for a goldenrod, uh, rather than having that arching pyramidal flower cluster. It has just this kind of vertical crown of flowers up at the top. Um, it also has very handsome foliage with deeply serrated leaves. And the zigzag goldenrod is going to tend to form a colony of plants in the same manner that the um, foam flower that I talked about earlier will form a colony of plants. So, you know, plant these plants in clusters, give them a few years, and they'll really fill in the space in your soft landings garden. On the right, we have calico aster. So calico aster um, is an excellent choice for your soft landings garden, and it pr provides just a huge number of blossoms. Uh, each of its branches is lined with these many um, small flower heads. And what's so cool about these flower heads is 
they change color as the season progresses. So as you can see in this picture, the central disc area of most of these flowers is sort of like a reddish pink. What that means is there's no more viable pollen left in those flowers. This is actually a signal to pollinators so that they focus their uh, visitation and their pollination efforts on the yellow centered flowers. Uh, after the uh, pollen is no longer viable, the plant uh, actually chemically changes the color of the central disc, letting pollinators know, hey, don't spend your time on this flower, focus on the yellow centered flowers. You might be thinking, well, why does the plant even bother keeping those uh, pink centered flowers, which have you know already uh, lost all of their viable pollen? The answer is, that by keeping those flowers, it has a larger floral display. So it's calling in pollinators from a greater distance. It's more conspicuous on the landscape and the pollinators will see it. And when they get in close, they'll focus their efforts on the yellow centered flowers. So certainly a very interesting kind of phenomenon that's happening with the calico aster. And this is true of all of the asters. Uh, next time you look at um, New England aster, you know, or um, panicled aster, or any of your favorite asters, um, you'll probably see that the discs of the flower heads have different colors, and you'll now be clued in on the fact that that's a message to the pollinators about where to focus their efforts. Okay, so um, there are other plants that we can plant in our soft landings garden in addition to the wildflowers. And this is if we wanna give more structure or more interest uh, to that shady space. So if you wanna plant a shrub, a really great option is spice bush. Spice bush is a very shade tolerant shrub. It does well in a soft landing situation. Um, and spice bush pretty much has everything going for it when it comes to wildlife benefits. Um, it has uh, flowers, which it's insect pollinated, so it's offering floral rewards early in the year. It produces berries, which are lipid rich and an outstanding energy source for our birds. And um, it also is the host host plant for the spice bush swallowtail, which has a really cool looking caterpillar. Um, that almost, uh, I, I recommend that you look it up. It almost looks like, I don't know, like a little snake or something. It's very interesting. Um, and uh, as far as aesthetics goes, spice bush has this very mellow yellow coloration in the fall. And um, it can really enhance the, uh, you know, the, the fall, the fall kind of ambiance in your yard. So that's a plant to plant um, to give extra structure to your soft landings garden. Additionally, you know, that tree that's providing the shade above your soft landings garden, um, it's maybe not gonna be there forever. If the tree is kind of on the decline, you might start thinking about uh, the next generation and replacing that shade tree. If so, you want to start a shade tolerant tree um, right there, you know, beneath your, de your declining tree. And one tree that uh, is recommended is the black gum. So this is a picture of a black gum. It is a, uh, it will eventually grow to be a very large, a large tree in stature, but um, it has uh, similar to spice bush and the other plants that we've been talking about, uh, just really a, a broad spectrum of wildlife benefits. So it, offers the floral rewards to insects. It produces berries that the birds love. Um, and in terms of its aesthetic appeal, it has really striking fall coloration, as you can see right here. It turns this brilliant red color. So um, yeah, if you're thinking about the next generation of shade trees in your yard, why not plant a black gum right there in your soft landings garden? Okay, so how do you go about uh, actually creating a soft landings garden? 
it's really not that hard. And that's one of the best things about it. And now is the perfect time of year to, uh, you know, undertake this kind of a project. So what you're going to want to do is eliminate the grass or other uh, weedy vegetation that is presently in, you know, in place at the base of your tree. And one of the best ways to do this is called the sheet mulching technique. So you're uh, just going to cover up the ground surface with cardboard. And then on top of that, rake all of your leaves onto the cardboard. You're gonna wanna wet this down so that uh, things are held in place and they're not blowing away. And as is shown in this uh, photograph, you might also want to put up one of these short, uh, short, easily removed wire fences um, to keep things uh, to keep things together. And um, really, all that's happening here is you're eliminating the vegetation which could potentially uh, compete with the native plants that you're going to be planting, which are going to be offering all of those pollinator benefits that we were talking about. Um, come springtime, you can, uh, the, the cardboard will be uh, very much uh, decomposed and you can simply cut holes wherever you want to put your native plants. Now, although you don't have to use leaves as the um, uh, cover on top of your cardboard, there really are the uh, best kind of material you can have as a, a ground cover or a mulch in this space. Um, so for one thing, our native bees, they don't have any trouble uh, pushing aside leaves and, um, you know, burrowing into the ground where 70% of them are performing their, their nesting. Uh, and similarly, the um, caterpillars, which are going to be undergoing their cocoon stage, they can make it through the leaves no problem, whereas something like wood mulch would potentially uh, provide more of an obstacle. And as we saw earlier with the example of the luna moth, many of our caterpillars are actually using the leaf itself as the outer layer of their cocoon. Um, furthermore, there's a tremendous variety of uh, in beneficial insects that complete one or more of their life stages in the leaf litter. Uh, and like, oh, let's see here. Insects this would include are hoverflies, lace wings, um, assassin bugs, uh, beetles, fireflies. The list goes on and on. Uh, they really have evolved to utilize the leaf litter. So this is a, a great use of those leaves that are piling up in your yard. So in the springtime, when it comes time to plant your uh, soft landings garden, um, what are some of the design considerations that you're going to want to be thinking about? Well, here they are. First of all, uh, it's a good idea to... Um, plant your flowers in clusters. So on in the lower left part of your screen, you can see just one recommended arrangement. Um, you, can, you can plant your, you can plant your plants in threes uh, that, and spread them out one foot on a side. So what's the advantage of planting your plants in a cluster like this? Well, really, you are speeding up the, the rate at which the flowers are going to form a, an obvious visual attractant to the pollinators. Research has shown that when your flower clusters are at least three feet in diameter, you are getting an extra boost in terms of attracting pollinators. Three feet is kind of like the cutoff at which those pollinators can see the flower cluster from a distance and come flying over. Additionally, it's a good idea to plant at least eight species of wildflowers in your soft landings garden. Research has uh, shown that when you have at least eight species of flowers, 
you have um, a significant increase in terms of the abundance and diversity of pollinators that you're attracting. Finally, you want to pay attention to those other landscaping objects we were talking about, such as the leaf litter. But a couple more I would mention include large rocks and decaying wood. So both of these are going to serve as uh, sort of other substrates where cat certain caterpillar species like to, per like to undergo their um, cocoon stage. In addition, there are lots of bees and other beneficial insects that like to nest uh, under decaying wood and large rocks, as well as in the cavities that um, beetles will build in the decaying wood. So these are just some of the design considerations to have in mind when you're putting together your soft landings garden. And finally, uh, where are you gonna find the plants for your soft landings garden? Well, one place that I would recommend is Meadow City uh, Native Plant Nursery. We have, we do carry all of the species that were um, highlighted in this presentation. And uh, although we're closed for the season now, we are gonna be um, opening up next May and we would love it if you stopped by. So um, that pretty much uh, covers, um, you know, the background and design of a soft landings garden. And um, I'd be happy to um, answer any uh, questions that uh, anyone may have. Let me um, maybe stop my share. I think maybe I should stop share. Okay. Thank you, Dave. I have a question for you. Yeah, please. Um, and I met you a couple of weeks ago when I came with Jack to buy some plants. So we chatted. So yeah, this was great. Um, something I hadn't thought about was the soft landings. My question for you around our house, we have mostly pine trees. And so as you talk about leaf litter, like we have tons and tons of pine needles. I'm trying to collect it to like make garden paths and mulch and flower beds around. But for like the caterpillars and other, I don't know much about the pine trees, about as far as who's on them, if the pine needles support them. Mm -hmm. I know pine needles have, is it acidity or something? Or The nitrogen? soil does tend to get acidified under pine trees, yeah. Yeah, so would you say that a lot of the things you mentioned could still translate to being under pine trees? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think that... Um, when it comes to the um, like the caterpillar benefit, like allowing the cocoon stage to take place, um, this is really going to partially have to do with how many caterpillars are your pine trees hosting. Mm -hmm. And like, while I know that the numbers are high for trees like oaks, cherries, and willows, mm -hmm. I honestly don't know what the numbers are like for your pine trees. Yeah. So like, I would say that if you know the species of your pine tree, what you can do is go to um, NWF Plant Finder and that will tell you the number of um, moths, butterflies, and sawflies that are using your trees as a host plant. And so that'll give you an idea of whether or not these um pine trees are actually you know hosting caterpillars okay if in if indeed they are you know like and for i don't know a lot of this also has to do with like the nativity of a species so if it's like a white pine or something like that that's like native to the region there's a much better chance that it's going to be hosting caterpillars than if it's like a norway spruce or like a scotch pine or something mm -hmm. um so, uh, but anyway, if you find out that your plant is hosting caterpillars, I would say then this would, this suggests to me that you want to stick with the native, like the natural, um, needle litter, which is accumulating there. You don't want to, yeah, I, I don't think that it would really serve you to transform 
that ground cover to like deciduous leaves because I think what we really want to do in our yards all the time is think about what would be happening in nature, you know, what would be kind of like an undisturbed situation in nature. So um, yeah, that's what I would recommend. And, you know, it could be that you find out that, okay, so I'm not really going to be hosting a lot of like caterpillars in this space, but that doesn't negate like the um, pollinator benefits that you can get from planting um, shade adapted native plants under those trees. So like, I would still urge you to, um, you know, have a shade garden in that space for that reason. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you so much. Looks sure like thing. Julie was looking up for me. So thanks, Julie. Does any, anybody else have any questions? Oh, which trees are best to make a soft landing garden under? Okay. So I would say that um, in terms of like, yeah, your benefits to um, caterpillars, like allowing them to complete their life cycle, the best trees are going to be A, the native trees, um, because those are the ones that the, ca that are, the caterpillars are evolved to, um, you know, utilize as host plants. And B, there's like a few kinds of native trees like a few groups that really support a lot of caterpillars. And those are the oaks, the um, cherries, the willows. Um, I mean, the hickories support a lot. The way that you can get a list is um, if you Google um, keystone plants and um, like keystone native plants, you should get a list of what are the top um tree uh genera which is just a fancy word for groups of trees that are um supporting the most caterpillars and those are also going to be the ones where you're getting the most bang for your buck in terms of um you know making a soft landings garden but um as i was just saying a minute ago even if you find out that your tree isn't hosting a lot of caterpillars you know make a shade garden under there anyway because um you know, make the most of that space in terms of helping other invertebrates and um, su supplying pollinator benefits. D does anybody else ha have any questions? Does the sod, does the sod landing need to be the size of the canopy? Okay, great question. Um, yeah, so the soft the soft landing. Um, yeah, if you're gonna do like, I mean, this is a situation where anything that you do is going to be an improvement in comparison to, um, you know, just uh, mowed grass up to the base of the tree. So, like, you know, yes, it's true that. If you're trying to cover the whole landing zone for the caterpillars, you know, when they're descending from the canopy, yes, it's true. Your soft landings garden would extend uh, through, you know, throughout the whole footprint of the tree, uh, you know, from branch tip to branch tip. But maybe that's like too big of a project for you to undertake. In that case, I would say do what's manageable for you. Um, and maybe it's just a soft landings garden that is like in a six foot radius uh, around the base of your tree. That's a great place to start and maybe um, increase it, you know, over the years so that you finally are covering that whole footprint and you're catching all of those um, caterpillars that might be dropping down to undergo their cocoon stage. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, thank, thank you so much, everybody. Um, oh, here's a great resource on soft landings if you'd like to read more. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I recommend people check, check that out. Um, but thank you so much to um, Wild Ones for um, in, inviting me to talk tonight. And... Um, 
yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I hope that you uh, got some good information. Thank you so much, David. So let me just see. I'm just making sure we didn't miss any other questions. Um, so any other last minute questions, updates? All right. Well, thank you guys, um, David and Julie from Meadow City Nursery. Um, and thank you guys all uh, for joining here today. We're really excited. Um, if you have additional thoughts uh, on events, activities, or or future um, items in general, you know, please, like I said, please share it in our survey, or please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and uh, also, if you're not a member, please consider joining us. We have a link in the, the uh, chat. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys all next month. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Bye, everyone. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks.